uh, I want to ask you, could we just um, not only thank our uh, musical team for what they offer, but all of the folks back here that do all this work on a Sunday morning, so grateful for them. And uh, they hold so much of it together. Uh, there are so many, so many parts, uh, moving parts flying in from all over the place on a Sunday morning to make it happen. I'm so excited about that. And hey, I uh, just want to say to everybody, if you participate in Christmas at all in your family, I just want to say you got 12 days. <laughs> That's just a public service announcement. It has nothing to do with the message. You got 12 days. And uh, I want to say if that causes you anxiety, we did a series on anxiety in November. You may want to check that out and it'll help you out. Um, I do want to lift up before we go on. I'm super pumped about what we're going to look at today. But uh, before we jump into that, I want to tell you, uh, lift up what we got coming on uh, for our Christmas schedule. So I think they're going to show a slide up here. There again, you'll see a QR code. Beth called it the thingy last week. Did you notice that? If you would just put your phone on the thingy. Um, that was great. I'm probably going to hear about that. Um, but um, if you click that, it'll show you what's going on in our schedule. And, and I had the guy show us, here's Loxahatchee. We just want to show Loxahatchee. Uh, so the 23rd is 6.30. We've got an outdoor service. And pray for, pray for good weather on that. How many of you were there last year that the minute I started to preach, it downpoured? And you were, you were there about that. And what was so funny, I remember that as a horrible experience. And so many came up to me and said, that was the coolest thing we did all year. <laughs> Which I had to have some therapy over that. I just want everybody to know and work kind of forgiveness issues. But anyhow, um, so we got that going on the 23rd. Then indoor Christmas Eve services are 335 and 630. Now, if I got this right, on the 23rd is not a candle, but it's glow stick night. Is that right, babe? And then, so that's the 23rd, then the 24th are traditional Christmas Eve candlelight services. And we're going to be doing three of those here. We, we're going to be do, doing two of them on the Lake Worth campus. I think we have one happening over on the West Palm campus and all of that. And remind everybody, I think then the next day, uh, which is uh, the 26th, is that right? That's going to be an online service. What we, what we do on that service is we give our volunteers and our staff a break. So lots of folks will be serving across those two days. There's a lots of move, lot of moving parts on that. And then we're just going to do an online service. And um, Trev was telling me about his message on that. And he said it's going to be really awesome. And so I'm excited about that. Um, all right. I want to encourage you, if you will, grab your notes or whatever that is that you use in this space. We're going to move into our teaching time. And I uh, want to remind everybody that today we are uh, in a series, we're calling the series Come Home. We are in week three of this series. And uh, I just sort of shared with you across this time that we've been using uh, the series as a gentle way to, first of all, just kind of push our in-person attendance. We have thrown so much attention, so much energy to online, and we're excited about that. Many, of, many folks are still online. Still yet today, most of our church, most of Community of Hope is worshiping through the service online, and we still, as best, our conservative counts are right at around 2,000 folks on a weekend. And, um, but um, we're trying to say in December, come on back if you can. If you're feeling better about it, step on back, and we see folks who are returning every week. The other thing that we're doing is we're exploring some of the deeper truths of the Christmas season. We're, we're, season, we're exploring the, what we call the mystery and the wonder of the incarnation. I've been kind of saying it this way most of the year, uh, as a church family, we, we study what we would refer to as a resurrection theology. We, we kind of come together around the central idea that Jesus uh, ra uh, was raised from the dead. That's a bodily resurrection. That's one of the, the miracles. We always say this, the Christian faith uh, didn't start primarily around a person. It started primarily around an event, and the event is the resurrection. That's really how the Christian faith came uh, uh, to being and began to take hold. This group of people uh, witnessed the bodily resurrection of Jesus, experienced him on the other side of death on a cross, and that began to take form. And we think of the early church starting just these small little clusters of people originally referred to as the way. 
and, um, you know, just sort of coming together around this idea. And that began to grow, eventually overtaking the Roman government and sweeping across the world the biggest religion on the world, if we would call it a religion. And so lots of folks are stepping into following Jesus. And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about uh, in this series. But in December, we want to explore the other miracle which is the miracle of the incarnation, Jesus coming to earth as a king, but coming as a baby. And so we've been looking at that together. We've been studying uh, that together. And, uh, you know, we think that um, this incredible truth was laid out for us at the hand of the apostle John who wrote, many believe the single most defining sentence about the Christian experience in its beginning in John chapter one, verse 14. I'm gonna have us read it out loud. We're going to put it there on the screen. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Go. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and full of truth. So this is the idea. This is John, the only apostle who was not martyred for his faith sometime in the, in the September, October, November season of his life, reflecting back over what he had witnessed, what he had seen, and he just said, the word of God made, was made flesh. I was reading an interesting thing uh, that this week that most people, even within the Christian church, listen to this statistic, most people, even within the Christian church, believe that Jesus' beginning was uh, his beginning when he was born in the manger. And that's not actually Christian theology. Christian theology says he is... God the Son, so he was always. And so, so this is the kind of thing that we're exploring, and I think we would ask the question as we look at this, does it matter? Should I care? Does it have foundational meaning for my life right now? Am I missing out if I don't understand this in some way? And to all of these questions, I want to say a resounding yes. This has deep meaning for our lives uh, right now. This is not hocus pocus. This is not magic. This is deep theology from the beginning of time that we can build our lives upon. Someone say amen to that. Amen. And I'm super pumped about what I want us to look at it uh, this, this week. And I kind of think of it this way. This is what we've said. We've said so far simply this, that Jesus left his home and you might want to write this down. He left his home so that we can know what God is like. So what is God like? God is like grace and truth. So if somebody asks you this week, you know, hey, I saw you pulling in to Loxahatchee, uh, that building that looks like the outback. I, I <laughs> remember when we built the building, as somebody, I met somebody in town. I told them where our church was, and they were disappointed it was a church. They said, I thought it was an outback. I wanted to quit right there. I was like, uh, I give up. But at any rate, um, you know, if they ask you, you could say it's like grace and truth. Uh, he is accepting. He is loving. He is caring. He is good. The scripture says he's good all the time. But he's also truthful. And I'm learning, I don't know about you, but I'm learning I need spaces in my life where, where people tell me the truth about me. Anyone else? I don't, need, I don't need to be affirmed all the time. My wife's down there going, amen. <laughs> it does not need to be affirmed all the time. And I need people that'll say, no, not good. Hey, that idea, that's not a great idea. Don't do that. And so God is graceful, but he's truthful. So we can know what God is like. Here's the other thing. Jesus uh, left his home so we can experience hope when things seem impossible. This is what I believe about every human life. I mean, life happens. And so every one of us, we got stuff in our lives. You ever notice how life is a combination of good and bad all at the same time? It's never a combination of one or, uh, you know, it's never one or the other. It's always both. There are these things that are just wonderful in your life. And there's always this other little spot. There's always this other little thing that's sort of in process or feels like it's falling apart or feels like it's a house of cards. There's this kind of idea always going, going on. And sometimes what we need to understand as the mystery of the incarnation tells us this, and we're going to look at it this week, uh, next week, don't miss it, uh, tells us this, there's more. There's more. Sometimes we go, is this, all, is this all there is? I mean, I'm just going to live, you know, my customary actuarial table. I'm going to live about, you know, what, 70, 80 years old, and then that, that's it? No, 
That's not it. There's more. And sometimes when things seem impossible, we need to know that there's hope. And so that's what we're looking at. And so today, I'm super pumped about this. What I want us to do, I want to add another truth to this list. And we're going to find this truth in Matthew's story about Joseph. And so I want to read the story to you, and then we're going to key in. There's one more truth that's sort of embedded in this story, and I want to read it to you, and I want to see if you get it, see if you catch it, and see if you're with me. We're going to talk about this this morning. I've been pumped about this all week long. And so here we go. This is Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This is Matthew, the tax collector's uh, rendition, his understanding, his, his historical narrative of the life and the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Here it is beginning in verse 18. Here's what, how he writes it. He says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. So if there's any question, right, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother was, uh, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public grace, a disgrace, he had in his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So now when Joseph woke up, he did, he actually did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Let's pray. God, would you uh, use this space to expand both our mind and heart around these truths? May, may you give us a capacity not to see this as just history. It is that. But Lord, I believe there's living word and living truth in this. So God, come and do what only you can do to build hope, to show us what you're like, and to say deep things to us that we can build our lives on. And we pray together in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. So last week, if you'll remember, we looked at what Mary's story teaches us. And uh, this week is Joseph's week. Here's some things I would want you to think about as we kind of poke into this from a historical per perspective at first. Uh, Joseph is one of the biblical characters that we don't really know a lot about. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a political figure. Uh, he was an ordinary person. And in all likelihood, here's the interesting thing to think about. We would likely not even know about him were he not tapped on the shoulder to be the earthly father of Jesus. He would, uh, in all likelihood, be unknown to us uh, in history. In, in this account, Matthew's account, what, one of the things that's interesting I want you to notice, that I notice in my study, is that he is listed as a descendant of David, which is significant. And it's significant because it puts Joseph in the spotlight of the divine plan unfolding for humanity as the adoptive father of Jesus. Uh, I think it's important that we would know this, that he was most likely an average Jewish young man in his later teens, probably having only some religious education and living with his parents or relatives when this encounter happened and the angel comes to tell him to go through with his plans to marry uh, or to wed Mary. We know that after Jesus was born, that Matthew uh, or, or that Joseph and Mary had four more boys and an unknown number of girls. We, we learn this in, actually in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, like Mary, the news of the coming of Jesus put him in a uniquely difficult place 
which um, I want to light a candle to kind of underscore the difficult place. And so uh, if you remember, we, we lit a candle in the first week. We said, let's light a candle to help us remember Jesus is the light, and in him there's no darkness at all. We lit a candle last week to commemorate the value that Christ's coming offers us hope when things impo- are, seem impossible. And this morning, I'm going to light a candle to, to communicate and underscore the idea of forgiveness. Uh, every one of us has an area in our lives where we work on forgiveness. Uh, I tell people all the time, forgiveness is not a one-time event, right? Do you know that? It's, it is a process. It's a process that you go forward and backward in. It's sort of like an onion that you peel, and there's just a lot of kinds of pieces to that. Uh, Some of us have areas uh, where we're working on the forgiveness of another person. All of us, notice what I'm saying, all of us, if we're honest, have areas where we're learning to forgive ourselves. This is just part of the human experience. And uh, Joseph's life, I think, in a really powerful way, stands uh, as as an emblem for us around the idea uh, of forgiveness, Last week, when we were looking at Mary, we understood that you know Mary's Mary's life. Um, Mary, Mary had no recourse when she found out she was pregnant through a supernatural means. This is I, you know I, I really wanted to create a lot of tension in the room last week uh, because I think that's part of this story, and I don't want us to glaze over that. Um, Matthew is almost in the same position, except he has some recourse. Here's his recourse. He could divorce her. And because this was an honor and shame culture and that everything really uh, in those days was founded on this idea of what kind of honor do you bring to your family system or what kind of shame do you bring to to your family system, it would have been appropriate. It would have been understandable. And, And this, it would have been typical for Matthew to divorce her publicly. Because what he would do in that moment would be to save himself from shame, uh, and and he could could escape through that. And so for Matthew to choose to not do that is incredibly powerful. And here's what I would tell you. It, It says something there, I think, about his character development. And, and it makes you wonder, is that one of the reasons maybe even, this is a, a message all in itself, is this potentially one of the reasons that God would tap him on the shoulder? Because he had the character requisite to step into the experience that he was uh, gonna, gonna experience, you know, the thing that he was gonna experience. So here's what I would tell you. This is what's interesting. At the micro level, this is a story about forgiveness, But here's what I want to tell you, because that's not really what I want to talk about on the micro level. On the macro level, on the zoom out level, this is a story about forgiveness. And that's the other thing I want to add. Um, Jesus left his home so that we could know what God is like. What is he like? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Jesus left his home so we could experience hope when things just look the worst. But did you, did you see embedded in the story the other reason Jesus left his home? It happens in verse 21. And it has this phrase, he will save his people from their sin. Did you see it? Let's all say it together. He will save his people from their sin. Say it again. He will save his people from their sin. Why did Jesus leave his home? Because he will save his people from their sins. I want to tell you attention. I uh, have been thinking about this week honest confession of a 
pastor and what I do kind of for a living. Um, I've been a little, little anxious all week long to preach this message because I thought, you know, how do I, how do I really warm people up to this idea because this seems like an old-fashioned idea. We don't really talk about sin a lot anymore. And I've been living in this tension space where, you know, Lord, I mean, it's Christmas. Uh, it's a weird year already. You want me to talk about sin? <laughs> and um, I want to make that confession to you. And all week long, I t- kind of tell you my prayer. I want us to learn about sin in a way that we understand it. And I was thinking about this, uh, praying about it, anxious about it, and I I thought of something. So, um, because here's what I would tell you. Right, think with me about this for just a quick minute. It, it, It takes something uh, powerful and important to make somebody leave their home. You ever notice that, right? Uh, I've shared before that, you know, Beth and I met uh, at seminary, and uh, I, had, I had left my house and felt a calling from God, and so I'm going to go to seminary, and I've, I've shared that experience, told that experience, and I'll never forget, uh, that I had a friend of mine that I, I met when I got to seminary, and uh, he kept telling me, he said, I, I want you to meet, I, I think you ought to meet somebody, and I, I was... I had just sort of ended a relationship. I'd moved to Kentucky. I was like, I, I really want to devote all my time and attention to seminary. And I felt this calling. I had this deep conviction about that. And at first I told my friend, you know, ah, I'm not really wanting to, wanting to do that. And then, then one day he showed me a picture. And I said, ah, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> I did not. I did not do that. I Relax. <laughs> Cheap laugh. Uh, actually, actually, he showed me the picture, and I went, well, I, I, yeah, I would like to meet her. <laughs> and then she came to class, and I met her, and wow, right? And um, you all know, you all know the secret beyond Jesus at Community of Hope. You all know the secret's my wife. We all get it. We all get it. Um, I'm not worthy, and I know it. I know it. I, I absolutely, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart all the time. I'm like, how did I even pull this off? But here's what I, here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. Uh, when we were engaged and uh, we were going through counseling, I think I've shared before that, that we were talking about what it would take to, for our marriage to work. And I can remember the, the guy that we asked to marry us one day in our counseling, he just said, hey, man, I just was thinking about something. I said, shoot, let me have it. And he goes, I'm just thinking about the fact that your wife is giving up everything to come live with you and move with you to Florida and do your thing. I'm just curious what you're willing to give up. That's how it felt in the room when he said that. It takes a lot. And when Beth and I've talked about that over the years, you know, Beth has said, well, you know, Dale, I hate to break your heart, but it wasn't about you. It was, it was about a conviction that I felt called. And that's, that's powerful. It takes a lot to leave home. This past week, uh, I thought of something. Um, the, the 7th, December 7th, do you remember what that was? Pearl Harbor, right? The 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And uh, I don't know if you remember Pearl Harbor, really what happened, uh, 2,403 casualties, 19 ships, 200 planes. Show you a picture there. And uh, I want you to know a little of the backstory. In early 1941, everything that was happening overseas was referred to as the emergency. Some of us will remember that. But here's what I want you to know. It wasn't our emergency. Okay? The invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany and the additional hostilities from England, France, Italy, and the Soviet Union continued right through the spring of 1941. And and in the spring of 1941, it was a European matter. 
In fact, at the end of the spring, I think it was, if I have my history right, it was May 11th, FDR signed what was referred to back then as a Lend-Lease Agreement. He had worked out with Churchill kind of offline in their friendship to provide military aid. But every time Churchill would call him and say, we're gonna need help, he said, not us, man. We're not in. It's an emergency. It's just not our emergency. And then December 7th, 1941 happened, and here's what I would tell you. It got personal. And less than an hour after the a date, which will live in infamy speech, listen to this, because this is unbelievable in today's culture. Congress voted nearly unanimously for the war. The Senate voted 80 to nothing. The House voted 388 to one. And the one House member who voted no, that was the end of their political career. Recruiter offices were overwhelmed with people leaving home to sign up for the war. Everybody was ready to do their duty. There was food and gas rationing, victory gardens, civil defense volunteers, scrap metal drives, paper drives, rubber drives. All these stood as tangible evidence of the unity of Americans in the days after Pearl Harbor. Why? Because it got personal. See, it takes something personal to make you want to leave your home. Historians say that was the single most defining moment, perhaps in U.S. history, where we were all united. I mean, Beth's daddy grew up in Texas as a farmer, farmland finds himself on a ship going to battle. Why? Because it got personal. And here's what I want you to think about when you think about sin. For God, it's personal. We live in a culture that I think has relegated sin to almost nothing. And in fact, I was thinking about this, um, we only normally think of it in one way. I want to share it with you. We think of it as an illegal offense before a holy God. Uh, We really think of sin little more than a mistake, an infraction. A uh, tell me what I got to do moment. Right? I remember one time we were with uh, our, our nephew, Matt, his precious wife, Jordan. They just had their first baby, Walker. I love Walker. And he loves P. Diddy. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> he says, I'm his favorite uncle. I'm, I think I'm his only uncle, but I'm his favorite uncle. Or, or Whatever, and um, however that works. And I can remember being with um, Matt and Jordan one time, and, and uh, Walker was really little, and, but he was starting to get to that squirrely stage, and Matt picked him up. And, and I saw the whole thing unfold, and it's like Walker looked at Matt, his dad, and he didn't, you know when a kid doesn't want to be picked up, right, there's that moment. And he didn't want to be picked up. And I saw, him, I saw Walker look at his dad, look out, look back at his dad, and headbutt his dad <laughs> right in the face, like split his lip. Just I saw the whole thing unfold. And, and, and Matt looked right at me, and he goes, I think that's Walker's first sin. <laughs> and I was like, I think so, and I just saw it. Most often we think of sin just as this legal indebtedness. And so often when we think of it, here's what I would tell you. It's just a transaction. What do we got to do moment? You know, I joke all the time about getting pulled over. I don't get pulled over as much as I joke about getting pulled over. 
I had a lady the last time I mentioned it. She came up to me afterwards and she said, I just want to say, Pastor Dale, I love you. Are you praying about how you drive? I'm like, ah. So, but here's the thing. Um, that's how we normally think of sin, right? We get pulled over. We call ticket clinic. Come on. We pay 90 bucks. It goes away. Now, here's what I want to show you. I want to show you real quickly. I'm going to dive into this for just a quick moment. In one way, that's not an unbiblical idea. Here's what Paul writes in Colossians 2. Look at what he says. When you were dead in your sins and transgressions in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins. Notice what he says here. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So it's biblically sound, but here's what I want to suggest to everybody in the room. It la- you know what it lacks? Here's what I think it lacks. It lacks emotion. Most of us don't cry when we get pulled over. I've thought about it, but <laughs> I don't cry. It, it's a legal offense before holy God. But because it's personal, can I show you two other images in Scripture that talk about sin? And I say this literally, this is not a tongue-in-cheek, and I hopefully, if we understand these other two images, maybe it would scare the hell out of us. Here's the second one. Sin is a form of bondage. Um, Jesus says in John 8, 34, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now that's different. That's not a transactional thing. Maybe you remember Paul the Apostle in his narrative in Romans 7, and he said this. He goes, why is it? You ever thought of this? You ever felt this way? Why is it that the very thing I want to do, I can't quite do, and the very thing I hate doing, I can't stop doing? How many of you have ever felt that way? (coughs) The thought comes in your head. The words come out of your mouth. The action just perpetuates. And this is what I think Paul, uh, Jesus is striking at when he says that sin is a form of bondage. Many of us know Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, and there's Jacob Marley who shows up, right? He's you know, got the chains on him and his inability to have any compassion for the poor and needy has impacted his eternity. Now we make that a joke. It's not really a joke. In a compelling book that I read recently by John Mark Comer, he makes this observation. He said, "Um, have you ever had a thought or feeling or desire that seemed to have a will to it? an agenda that was hard to resist and not thinking it felt like fighting against gravity. It seemed to have a weight or a power over you that was beyond your ability to resist. C.S. Lewis in his day said this, there is absolutely, I believe, no neutral ground in all of the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. John Wesley had a brother named Charles who many believe wrote over 8,000 hymns. That's a lot of, that's a lot of music. Uh, one of his most famous hymns is the hymn, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And uh, 
There's a line in that hymn that is so powerful, moves me every time. He writes this and sings this. God breaks the power of canceled sin. (laughs) I get emotional about it. He sets the prisoner free. If you've ever been set free, you never think of it the same way. I was reading a story a while ago about a guy by the name of John Currier who had actually uh, he robbed a bank, got caught. He was sent to the Atlanta penitentiary to live out his sentence. And after a while, his sentence was commuted. He was sent to a lesser secure prison to live out his sentence. And then, interestingly, his sentence was commuted. He was forgiven. But the note that told the prison that got lost in the mail. So he lived another 12 years in prison when he was actually free. And I just want everybody to know in this room that if you're living under the bondage of your sin... You're doing that against the will of a heavenly father who's come to set you free. (laughs) Don't you want to be free? Don't you want the legal infraction set aside and don't you want the bondage to subside? I've sat with so many people who just tell me the story of Romans 7 out of their own life. I can't stop. And I tell them, yeah, you can. But you can't do it in your power. Can do it in his. You got one more in you? I think the answer to that's yes. yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, sin is a disease that causes death. Listen to how Jesus, half brother, says it. When tempted, he says, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anybody. Thank the Lord. Now, notice this. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own sin, their own evil desire, and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? Death. Here's the imagery of what he's trying to communicate. When we stay in our sin, ultimately we become the personification of that sin and our life literally closes in around us. When you hate people long enough, here's what happens. You just become hate. You ever met anybody like that? This is why we kind of push against those kinds of things because if we don't push against those things, we become those things. This is the disease that sin creates. Greg Boyd in his book, Letters from a Skeptic, says a powerful thing. He says, listen to this. The more we choose something, the harder it is to choose anything else. This happens until we are solidified and eternalized by our decisions. It works like this. The momentum of our character becomes unstoppable. It's like a disease that infects us. We create our character with our decisions, and our character in turn exercises more and more influence on the decisions we make, and what starts as a decision ultimately becomes our nature. This is why somebody wrote, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, Reap a destiny. But Paul says it this way. While you were still yet sinners, Christ came and then died for you. Almost makes you want to dance. (laughs) Nobody wants to see me dance, trust me. Yeah. What do I want you to know about sin? For God, 
It's personal. It's personal. Can I want to encourage you to grow, grow past legal infraction? Your sin's not a ticket. It leads to bondage and will kill you. It'll kill you on earth and in heaven. Thanks be to God who sent us Jesus Christ. Right? Here's what I want to do. I'm going to invite the team up. We're going to close out in a song. And uh, here's what I want you to do. I want, you to, I want to read one other scripture, and then I'm going to give you an exercise. We're going to practice something this morning. So the scripture is what King David writes in Psalm 139, where he says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me to the way everlasting. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. If, for the brave ones in the room, grab your phone. Take a minute and, and, and just before the Lord during this song, go, Lord, here, here are my legal offenses. And if you're really brave, go, Lord, here's where I feel like I'm in bondage. Maybe some of you right now are going, I don't want to put that on my phone and put it right here in your head. And maybe some of you would, would be really courageous and go, Lord, here's my disease. I need to be healed. You know, oftentimes, can I say this? When the Bible uses the word save, do you know the translation on that word in the Greek? Heal. Isn't that interesting? Confess your sins, James said, so you may be, not forgiven, so you may be healed. Let's do some work before the Lord. Lord God, what great news that is. What great, great news that is that God, we don't have to walk around in chains. We don't have to look like Jacob Marley. We can be forgiven, we can be free, and that, Lord, the, the idea of that, that very idea of that caused you to leave your eternal home so that you could span through space and time and bring forgiveness and offer hope. I pray every one of us online and here accept that hope in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus alone, and everyone said, Amen. Go and live in hope because you're forgiven and free. We'll see you next weekend. Praise God.